All right. Come on in. Those of you here, grab a songbook. Let's turn over to number 11. He is mine. He is mine. Number 11. One, one. Once you have it, let's all stand together to sing. All right, everybody standing. He is mine, Brother Bob. Long before the fall of man, God designed a master plan. He exchanged the sinner for the sinless one. Jesus left his throne on high, came to earth to bleed and die. He said, Father, not my will, but thy singing you're not singing like you're too full that's good and uh good meal tonight and uh thank you again for all the good food that was brought in and uh great time at the parade this morning and uh had 58 of us there uh some on the ride and some walking along and uh we i tell you what 2000 john and romans went fast and uh we we probably could have had at least double that amount and passed it out along the way, and the folks were uh, well received, and uh, it was a great time. Thank you to all of you who took the time, and uh, it was a long morning, and uh, but it was great to be there, and good to be part of the community, and for them to see us, and uh, appreciate the good work Brett did on getting things ready, and others who helped him along the way there, and uh, it was a great, great time, and something that will, we got a year to prepare now, and we saw some things that will help us. And uh, saw some things that we that we did this year that we know we shouldn't do, and uh, we'll uh, write these things down, and we'll improve and be better and bigger and better for next year. Uh, it's a great time, and uh, appreciate all you did. All right, and uh, let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you, Lord, for a wonderful, wonderful day today. Thank you, Lord, for the good time at the parade this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the good meeting out at London with the RU inside. Thank you for the men who were there today. Lord, we thank you for the restful afternoon and then for the opportunity to have a meal together again here tonight and then gather in here for the service. And Father, I pray you'd help us now to uh, focus in our minds and to concentrate that we not miss what you have for us here th this evening. pray you'd be with Brother Adam Jarvis and uh, Brother Jack Jarvis as they speak to us this evening. 
Lord, may you give us ears to hear what the Spirit would say to his church now this evening. We love you. We're so thankful, Lord, that we can sing what we sang tonight, that he is mine. He is mine. I'm blessed beyond all measure. He is mine. We love you, Lord. May you be pleased with the service tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, be seated if you will. Brother Adam, you come if you would. Brother Adam Jarvis is going to present this evening, and uh, he and his family are going down to Honduras. And uh, Adam, you have the next uh, till 7.15, 35 minutes, and uh, use it any way you'd like. All right, I think so. All right, well, it is a blessing to be here with you all this evening. And um, I want to thank Pastor Slabaugh for allowing me to come, for inviting us to this missions conference. And uh, we have been treated very well. We, are, uh, we have been blessed. We have enjoyed our time here. Everyone except, um, except Tanya Reed has treated us very well. No, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I am Tanya's uh, little brother. And um, when I was um, young, I told my mother one of my life goals, and that was uh, to be taller than Tanya. And I have since accomplished that life goal. So anyways, but what, what I would like to do uh, this evening is tell you just a little bit about myself, about how the Lord um, directed me and has uh, kind of worked in my life. And then at the very end here, we'll show the video. So we'll do the video kind of at the end, kind of to keep you all in suspense. But um, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. When I was 12 years old, we went on a missions trip. Uh, some of you have heard kind of a, a, another version of this story from my dad, um, Jack Jarvis. But uh, we went on a missions trip to uh, El Paso, Texas. We lived in Minnesota at the time. And uh, my dad ended up moving our family down there to El Paso, and I was really excited about it. As I was uh, 12 when we went our first time, I was 14 when we moved there, and I really enjoyed that. And uh, it was kind of a neat experience. It was kind of a unique opportunity for me as a young teenager to spend my teenage years uh, around uh, missionaries, around people who were serving the Lord full time. And as a young man, I uh, I, I watched carefully. Um, I didn't I didn't ask a whole lot of questions. I didn't ask a lot of theological things or anything like that. I just watched the people that were working there. I watched uh, especially my dad and, and the other missionaries there at Bering Precious Seed in El Paso, and I saw the joy that uh, they had in serving Jesus. And it kind, of a, it kind of came as a slow dawning to me, why would I do anything else with my life? Than serve the Lord. And I remember one, one uh, evening, we had just finished a missions trip, and it was a, an evening in June, it was a Thursday night, and I was, uh, um, I was sitting there listening to a message, and the message that was being preached was to the group that was there that had come on the missions trip, but I was also sitting in the auditorium, and the Lord was speaking to me through that man named Carlos Demers preached a message. And I remember very distinctly, he preached out of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34. And it says this, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. And it was like the Lord said to me, Shame on you that there's people out there that do not have the knowledge of God. We enjoy being saved. We enjoy the blessings and the benefits of living, um, knowing that we're saved, or the, the security of knowing that we're going to heaven and enjoying the benefits of, of Jesus and, and having the Word of God with us any time that we would care to open it. But it was like the Lord said, shame on you that there's others out there that do not have the knowledge of God. And so at that time, I went forward and, and um, you know, there's another verse in, in Matthew 9 when it talks about uh, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And it says, pray that the Lord would send forth laborers into the harvest. And the question in that verse is not whether or not the lost people are going to get saved. The question in that verse is whether the saved people are going to go. And so I went forward that evening and I, I told the Lord, I, I remember I came down to the altar and I said, Lord, I will go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I remember um, making that decision and and in the following days, I, I kind of uh, looked back and I thought, man, 
now I'm like, uh, I don't know what you would say, one of the, uh, one of the elite you know, Christians, right? Because I'm not just the, the person who's saved, but now I'm, the one, now I'm one of the, the elite, one of the fully surrendered, one of the ones who's willing to do whatever. But um, really, if you just dust the pride off of that, that statement right there, all that is, is me getting right with God. Because any of us, if we're not willing to do whatever God wants, then we're not right with God. And so it's just me coming to the point where I realize I need to be right with the Lord. And so throughout my teenage years, I, I lived um, in El Paso and I went off to, to Bible college. And um, you might have heard earlier this week one thing that my father said. He said, uh, one of the best things about being a missionary is you don't have any money. Well, that proved true in my life as well when I went to college because I didn't have any money. And one of the ways that the Lord provided some of the money for, for my, myself and my sisters as well to go to college is that they had work available for us on campus. And so we worked there at the, uh, at the college. And I say this is a great blessing because there was another young lady who also didn't have enough money to go to college. And she worked there as well. That was my wife. And um, it was a blessing. We both met. We met at work there. And um, it, was, it was a real blessing um, at that time. I remember there was one time when um, there was a bunch of people in a group. We were all at work, and there was a bunch of different people there. And they were talking about their favorite foods and, and things like this. And, and uh, there was, some of the girls were saying, well, I like you know, lobster and, and, and steak and all this stuff. And I remember my wife, who was, I wasn't even, we weren't even um, in an official relationship, whatever you want to call that. We weren't even um, dating or courting or whatever at that time. She said, uh, she said this, I remember it very clearly. She said, one of my favorite foods is beans and cornbread. And I thought, oh, this is good. You know, this, this, is, a, this is a good thing because... You know, uh, the woman that I marry, if, if I'm going to, you know, I probably won't, uh, there won't be a whole lot of lobster and steak dinners, but I thought maybe this is the Lord leading here. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so anyway, to uh, getting off track here, but the Lord, um, after we graduated, the Lord allowed us, we got married, and then for three years, we worked in the ministry of uh, Bearing Precious Seed in El Paso, and that's where my two oldest children were born, Lily and Jackson, they were born there. And uh, so we, uh, we enjoyed uh, being a part of that ministry. And then in September 2008, I went up to uh, Milford, Ohio, which is the, uh, the, the headquarters of the Very Precious Seed Ministry there. And I went up there. They, they asked me, they said, Adam, they said, you're a member of our church. You're working in our ministry, but you're 1,600 miles away from us and we really don't know you, and you don't really know us, so why don't you come up here and do an internship? And I said, okay. And they said, it, it was about, I said, how long? They said, oh, maybe a year and a half to two years. And I thought, all right, that would work. You know, I can leave. I, I really like Texas, but I could leave for a year and a half. That'd be all right. And um, I think sometimes, I don't know if this is true in your life at all, but I think sometimes the Lord um, doesn't tell us the whole story. He knows where he's leading us and he knows where we're going to go and he knows that we'll be better off once we get there. But because we don't understand and because we don't see the whole picture, if we were to know the whole story up front, we'd say, no, I don't, I, I don't want to do that. Because what happened was is my year and a half in Milford turned into almost six years. And um, I guess I was a slow learner. I don't know. But, um, but what happened was is uh, I, was, I was up there, and we finished my internship, and, and uh, I was uh, Pastor Dutchry there. He said, well, he said, I'd like to send you back to El Paso. And I said, great, I'd like to go back to El Paso. I like the ministry there. It's, it's a great ministry. And, and I told the Lord I wanted to serve him full time. I wanted to, to work in the ministry. And I thought, besides, my parents are there. I could have free babysitting. This is great. And um, so Pastor Dutchry said, well, I'd like to send you back there. He said, but he said, with the transitions and things, he's working out. He says, I don't, I don't have peace about it this year. He said, but maybe next year. I thought, okay, I can wait a year. A year, yeah, I can do that. So then a year later, uh, he said, you know what, Adam? He said, we're, we're working through some different things. And he said, he said, I just, honestly, he said, I don't have peace about sending you back there right now. 
And uh, I said, OK. And he said, maybe next year. I said, all right, OK. And then the next year came around. He said, Adam, he said, you know, we've been, we've been talking about this. He said, we, we really, um, he said, I, I'd really like to send you back to El Paso. He said, but you know, the Lord just hasn't given me peace. And, and there's things working out and, and that he said differently. And he said, I, he said, I can't send you back there right now, maybe next year. And I thought, hmm. And uh, I started to get a little, bit, a little bit frustrated because I thought, here's what I want to do. I want to serve the Lord. That's a good thing, right? I want to be in the ministry. Isn't that a great thing? Yes, I agree. That's a great thing. And it was like the Lord said to me, Adam, you can serve the Lord wherever you are. You don't need to have a specific place to serve the Lord. Where you are right now, that's where you should be serving the Lord. And uh, I, I kind of got into this debate, so to speak, you know, and as I'm thinking about this, I'm praying about this, I said, but God, you know, if you just send me back to El Paso, I'll be content there. And it was like God said, Adam, you should be content wherever you are. I said, well, yes, Lord. And, uh, you know, as you know, the Lord's right and I'm wrong. When, whenever we disagree, that's how it works. God's right and I'm wrong. But uh, I, I, all of a sudden, it dawned on me that here in my life, I had this, uh, this desire to serve the Lord. And I, des- I, I told the Lord that I would do whatever he wanted me to do. And my thought was, well, I will serve the Lord in this particular ministry because, well, I like it, because I'm familiar with it, because I know about it. And one thing, you know what I realized? I had never prayed about it. I thought, oh, it's a good thing, right? God, all, I mean, things that are good, that, those are things we should do, and this is a good thing, and I should do that. And I don't know if it's true in your life. Maybe there's some times that you think, well, this is something I like, and this is something that's not bad, so I'm not even going to bother praying about it because, you know, if you pray about it, sometimes God might lead you something different, and it's something you don't know, and it's something that you're not familiar with, and, and it might be a little... You might be a little nervous because of the unknown. And so I realized that in my life, I, although when I was a teenager, I had said, Lord, I'll do whatever, I'll go wherever, that in my heart, I had said, okay, Lord, I'll do whatever and I'll go wherever, and this is what it is. When I should be saying, God, what would you have for me? Because... In reality, God knows what's best for us. God meets our needs, and that brings glory to Him. But sometimes God doesn't meet our wants, which may or may not bring glory to ourselves. And so I, I, decide, I thought, here I am. In, in the middle of this, I need, to, I need to pray about it. I need to ask the Lord. And I, I came to the Lord, and I said, Lord, whatever you would have me to do, that's what, I would, that's what I want. I want what you want. Because when we realize that God knows even better than we know what's best for us. And so I made that prayer. And it wasn't uh, too long after that that I got a phone call from a, from a really good friend of mine. We were in each other's weddings. And uh, we had gone to college together. And he, um, at the time, was pastoring a church up in Connecticut. And he called me up. He says, Adam, he says, I got some great news for you. I said, really? What's that? He said, oh, we just had the mission conference at our church. I said, wow, that's great. He said, and I'm resigning my church. I'm going to the mission field. I said, wow, that's great. And he said, and I want you to come with me. And I said, wow, that's what? (laughs) He said, oh, he says, this is, he said, there's this ministry in Honduras there's a missionary there. He said, he's looking for help. He's looking for some young guys to come. He said, I know your experience that you've had in Mexico. And, and he said, I think this would be a great thing for you. I think you'd love it. He said, and he said, I, I think would make a great team going together because I know you and you know me. He said, I think it'd work out really well. And it's God's will. So you better go. I said, okay. Um, well, God hasn't said anything to me about that yet, but Um, And he said, well, he said, let me ask you this. Would you be willing to go on a mission trip there? I said, absolutely. I would love to. I love mission trips. I've gone on dozens of mission trips in my life. 
I've all been to Mexico, but I've gone on a lot of mission trips. And he said, okay. And I said, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I said, I, I, I want my wife to go with me because if we're going to go um, see this, this ministry. And at this time, I had, I had finished my, my internship and I was working on staff um, at the church in Milford. And I was, I was still getting a lot of training, a lot of, um, I was learning a lot of things. But um, I was looking for another, another ministry and, and Pastor Dutry as well. He said, we'd like to help you in whatever the Lord wants. And if that's, if that's some other ministry, he said, we, we want to help you towards that. And so um, at the time, I, I, told, I told my friend, his name is Chris Burkholz, and I said, Chris, I said, I, I want my wife to go with me. And what I, would, I haven't obviously planned for any of this yet, so trying to figure out the costs and all this stuff, I said, it'll probably be several months before I have the money together. But as soon as I get the money, I'll go. He said, all right hung up the phone. Two weeks later, I called him back. I said, hey, guess what? God provided the money. Let's go. And so we went, uh, my wife and I went on a mission trip. We went down there to um, a place in, uh, called Santa Rosa de Copan in Honduras. And uh, we went down there, and about 30 minutes outside of the city, there is a, an orphanage there. There's a man who went down there about 25 years ago. His name is Ronnie Doss, and uh, he was a pastor in Alabama, and uh, he started going on mission trips to Honduras, and uh, he went on one mission trip, and he liked it. He went on another mission trip. He really liked it. He went on another mission trip there. He loved it, and finally he stayed, and so uh, he went down there with the desire to plant churches in the mountains, in the, the villages around in, in Honduras. Um, he said there, there were several missionaries. Some of them we know we're good friends with that live in the city. But there's not very many that uh, go out into the mountains and the small villages there. And so he wanted to plant churches out there. Well, one thing he and his wife noticed when they got there, there are many, many orphaned or abandoned children in Honduras. And uh, he, he thought to himself, he said, we're going to be, he said, we want to train men to pastor these churches. We're going to plant a, churches. We're going to need to train men. But why wait till they're 20 or 30 or 40 years old? before we start training them. He said, we can start when they're two, three, and four years old. So uh, he and his wife, they opened an orphanage, and they started taking in uh, children and to, uh, to raise them with a purpose to raise them up to reach their fellow countrymen for the Lord. And uh, sometimes he, he would get a call from a, a local judge or somebody who said, there's a little, little baby here. I don't know the name. There's no parents. Don't know the birthday. Do you want him? And he and his wife would go down there and pick up this child and give him a name, give him a birthday to celebrate, and uh, just take him back and, and, and raise him up. And so um, he, when we went there, um, the Chris Burkholz and my wife and I went, and um, I, we met with uh, Brother Ronnie and his wife, and, and Brother Ronnie said, he said, for the last two years, he said, I've been praying for a couple of young men, a couple of young families to come and help in this ministry. He said, and I know that uh, Chris Burkholz here is, is one of these families. He said, and I, I'd like to pray about, he said, see if, if maybe you are the other, the other family that would come. And I said, well, I, I said, I'll, I'll definitely pray about it. And uh, we went down there, and I knew one thing I didn't want to do was I didn't want to make him an emotional decision. Because if you're around little kids, it's, I mean, if you're not emo if, if it doesn't touch you emotionally, I mean, you're you're probably not human. But uh, we uh, we uh, and and I had seen I had known in the past uh, just from the the ministry we've been in before I had seen people that uh, God had led to the ministry in El Paso, and I had seen other people that had come on 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 emotional decisions and caused a bunch of problems and left some of them in the middle of the night. And I didn't want to be that kind of person. I didn't want to cause problems in the ministry. I wanted the Lord to be the one to lead us there. And he said, Brother Ronnie said, Adam, he said, if you come, he said, I'd like you and your wife to, to oversee and to supervise the children's home and to take care of them and, and to make sure that their needs are met and to, train, to, to work in, in training them. And uh, I said, well, well, we'll pray about it. And my wife and I went down to the building that they call the clinic. And in the clinic, it's where all the little children live, ages zero to six years old. There's about 23 of them 
And uh, there's one young lady, 19-year-old girl, who takes care of them. So she's basically their, their mother, takes care of nine, uh, 23 kids up to six years old. So you can imagine she's, she's pretty busy. But um, we walked up to the building there, and uh, there's, a, there's a little fence, a little gate around it. And the kids had looked through the windows, and they saw Elisa and I coming. And they got all excited. They came running out to see us, and they, they were so excited. They wanted to hold our hand. They wanted, to, they wanted to talk to us. They didn't care if our Spanish was good or not. They just wanted to spend time with us and, and smile at us. And, and as I, I looked at them, I, I noticed something. See, growing up, I had seen poverty before, and, and many places in Honduras, there's a lot of poverty, but I had seen poverty. I had seen cardboard houses and, and things like that. The poverty didn't, didn't affect me. What really affected me was I had never before seen people who were so starved for love. And I noticed, I thought, you know, I've been blessed. I know my parents love me, and I know that... Um, that I, I've never doubted that. I thought, I've really been blessed growing up. And I thought, you know, as I looked at, I saw these kids, I thought, some of these kids will never, ever know what it's like to be loved by their parents. And that's a, sad, a, a terrible thing, a sad thing. But God has a way of taking things that are bad and turning them into things that are good. And I got back on the plane, my wife and I, when we got ready to leave Honduras, and sitting at the airport in San Pedro Sula, uh, before the plane took off, I opened up my Bible and I looked at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 19. It's a verse that we have in our prayer card. It says this, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. And I thought, you know, these kids may never know what it's like to be loved by their parents, but we can take something even greater than that to them. We can take the love of Christ to them. And uh, so the Lord, the Lord used that and many other things um, to lead us to go down there. And uh, we're, we can't wait. We're excited. We're actually leaving um, four weeks from this upcoming Tuesday. And so we have our tickets. We're, we're planning to go down there. We're all excited about that. And uh, the Lord is just blessed. And we, we just couldn't be, couldn't be happier about what God is doing in our lives. And so we're we're excited to go down there to work, to work with these children and to show them the love of Christ. And I thought something very interesting about that verse. It says, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. So how do you know something that's beyond knowing? Well, I can't tell you exactly how big God's love is, but I can tell you this. I can go all the way up to the end of my understanding, and God's love goes far beyond that. And so we, uh, we are just uh, thrilled with how the Lord, the Lord has been blessing in our lives. And um, we have uh, lots, of, lots of stories along the way about how the Lord is taking care of us and how we realize that it's not us that's doing it. It's the Lord who's doing the work. And um, that we, uh, we have felt so incapable many times, but we know that even though it's bigger than us, it's not bigger than God. And uh, God's the one who's, who's going to lead us through that. So at this time, um, I have a video that uh, kind of explains a little bit more about the ministry. You'll see some pictures of the place there and uh, the ministry there, and I uh, hope it's a blessing to you. My name is Lily, and our family is going to Honduras as missionaries, and we are the Jarvises. I was blessed to be raised in a godly home by missionary parents. After graduating from Bible College in 2004, my wife and I had the opportunity to work in Bearing Precious Seed of El Paso, Texas, before continuing my training under Pastor Bill Dutry in the ministries of First Baptist Church, Milford, Ohio. The Lord has used these factors in my life not only to give me a burden for children, but to instill in my heart the importance of training mission-minded servants for all levels of ministry. 
I believe he has led our family to a place where we have the incredible opportunity to do both. In the mountains of Santa Rosa de Copan, Honduras, there is a thriving ministry led by veteran missionary Ronnie Doss. The Lord has placed a church planning ministry with an orphanage of approximately 100 children, a Christian school, and a Bible institute. 22 indigenous churches have been started, many of them pastored by men who came to the orphanage as young boys. This ministry has truly been blessed and is producing fruit, but is reaching a critical point. As Brother Doss nears retirement age, there is nobody to take his place. After much prayer, the Lord has led us to partner with the Burkholz family to come alongside the Doss family and continue developing this growing ministry. There are approximately 180,000 orphaned or abandoned children in Honduras. These orphans are caught in a vicious cycle of neglect and hopelessness. Never hearing the gospel or of the love of the Heavenly Father, they grow up in a lifestyle of drugs and violence, creating more orphans who will grow up to do the same. Some may see these fatherless children as a lost cause. The devil sees them as a personal victory, but we believe God sees them differently. We believe these precious children have the amazing potential to be used of God to grow the Honduran church. In the Santa Rosa ministry, we will have the unique opportunity to not only meet their physical needs, as James 1.27 tells us, but also to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, bring them to a saving knowledge of Christ, and disciple them through a Christian education. As they graduate from the Bible Institute and plant churches in their own villages, God can use these once forsaken children to break the cycle of wickedness in Honduras and raise up a generation that knows Him. 22 churches have been started already, and more are being built. Honduras can be one to Christ. Honduras can bring glory to God. Hi, my name's Jackson, and we're going to Honduras because Satan wants those kids for himself, and we can't let him win. Who here among us has not been broken? Who here among us is without guilt or pain? So off abandoned by our transgressions, such a thing as grace exists. Then grace was made for lives like this. There are no strangers, there are no outcasts, there are no orphans of God. So many fallen, but hallelujah, there are no orphans of God. Come ye unwanted and find affection. Come all ye weary, come lay down your head. Come ye unworthy, you are my brother. Such a thing as grace exists, then grace was made for lives like this. There are no strangers, there are no outcasts. There are no orphans of God, so many fallen, but hallelujah, there are no orphans of God. Oh, blessed Father, look down upon us. We are your children. We need 
your love we run before your throne of mercy and seek your face to rise above there are no strangers there are no outcasts there are no orphans of God so many fallen but hallelujah there are no orphans there are no orphans there are no orphans of to suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of God well that was good that's incredible 22 churches started already and uh, how many more in the years to come that's uh, that's tremendous praise God all right well listen carefully now um, tomorrow morning uh, regular schedule 9 30 for the Sunday school classes and uh, missionaries will be in different classes during the Sunday school hour and then uh, 10.30 for the morning service, and Brother Jarvis will be preaching. And then the closing service tomorrow night at 6.30. All right, so I uh, plan to be here uh, in your place. But uh, right now, why don't we take a songbook and let's sing again together. Number 272. How about I'm on the winning side? 272. Let's stand together to sing it. Brother Bob will lead us. Once I drifted out and sinned, had no hope nor joy within, and my soul was burdened down with pride. Then my Savior came along, and he showed me I was wrong. Now I know I'm on the way. Thank you. 
singing you can be seated great job tonight ushers will come and we'll get our offering tonight again we'll go to be a blessing to our missionaries this week that have come our way and uh, let's pray and ask God to bless the offering this evening father thank you for the privilege it's ours to give to your servants thank you lord for the blessing we've received already this week from them thank you lord for your goodness to us and I pray you'd bless the offering tonight and Lord I, I would ask you that you would allow us to be a great source of encouragement and blessing to these servants of, the, of God that you sent our way Lord and be with brother Jarvis tonight as he speaks to us from your word uh, may our hearts be open to what you want to say to each of us in Jesus name we pray Amen yeah.
song. Somebody, somebody said they thought that song was written in the Garden of Eden. Adam sang it. Jesus loves Eve and me. Just, just checking your theology there, all right? And uh, seriously, uh, I think Bob was talking about that a few weeks ago. P.P. P. Bliss wrote that song. P.P. Bliss wrote a lot of songs in your hymn book. And uh, one of the earliest songs that he wrote was, Oh, How I Love Jesus. And uh, we sing that song, and, and it's a good song. Uh, but as he got later on in his life, he realized what's more important is that Jesus loves me. And he wrote that song to say, I'm so glad that my Father in heaven tells of his love and the book he has given. And the longer you live for God, the more you find that you don't want to talk about your love for him. You want to talk about his love for you. And uh, that, that's a great song. Thank you for using that. Well, uh, you heard Brother Sharpetta sing the other night, and uh, we're around here used to hearing Brother Bob Reed sing, and somebody suggested you ought to put those two together and let them sing. And uh, so they're going to sing a song together tonight, all right? So uh, come on, you guys, and uh, they're going to sing. Then Brother Jarvis, come and preach to us, okay? Once my soul was astray from that heavenly way and was wretched and vile as could be, but my Savior in love gave me peace from above when he reached down his hand for me. When my Savior reached down for me, when he reached way down for me, I was lost and undone without God or his Son, when he reached down his hand for me. I was near to despair when he came to me there and he showed me that I could be free then he left at my feet gave me gladness complete when he reached down his hand for me my Savior reached down for me when he reached way down for me I was lost and undone without God or his son when he reached down his hand Now my heart does rejoice when I hear his sweet voice. In the tempest to him I then flee, there to lean on his arm, safe, secure from all harm, since he reached down his hand for me. When my Savior reached down for me, when he reached way down for me, I was lost and undone without God or his Son, when he reached down his hand for me. I was lost and undone without God or His Son when He reached down His hand for me. That was great. You, 
uh, don't normally have two Brother Jarvises around, but now you have the new and improved Brother Jarvis. That's right. So, uh, it, it is such a blessing. We've, uh, my wife and I have truly enjoyed um, being here. Some of the introductions that I've gotten, I, I can't wait to hear whoever it is because it sounded really good, you know, when you said you invite and introduce. But anyway, uh, the Lord has been uh, really good to us, uh, and, and we've told you a lot of things about that. And, and the point of, um, of, of these things that uh, talking about God answering prayer is uh, when we talk about faith promise, and I'll talk more about that tomorrow, but that's something that, um, well, it, faith promise is something that's a, it's a covenant you make with God. Uh, you have the faith. He takes care of the promise. Now, we're not used to doing that, but this is, this, this is one of the... If you're not used to trusting God, if you're not used to stepping out in faith, and unfortunately, a lot of times in our lives, we, we don't do that because, you know, we're always trying to plan our life based on what we can do. And uh, unfortunately, that's a, that's a pretty sad thing in the sense that you really limit God in your life when you do that because you don't include him into this. Yeah. And... Uh, like the, the mission trips, and you know, I, I'm, I'm very familiar with the mission trips, and uh, see, I was talking to someone last uh, night, uh, Luann, is that her name? She's not here tonight? She's here? Yeah, well, I, she was telling me how much it, you know, she just loved it, and you know, really needed to trust God, and, and she really wanted to go on a mission trip, and I said, well, sign up for it right there. Just sign up for it, uh, oh well, okay, and so she, she signed up for it. And, uh, you know, she said she didn't have any money, she doesn't have any time and, you know, the work and all that. But, um, you know, those are little things to God. They're big things to us, but they're little things to him. And so the, the point here is, is that we are willing to make these steps, the faith that, that God can use us even more. There, there's so much you can do with your life that, that you didn't think you could. God wants you to do that. I want you to turn to Philippians. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, prayer. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. And Philippians is a great book. I, I can hardly read it. i got so much writing all over these pages. But uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. God's word, uh, God's word says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, dear God, we love you so much. and Lord, we need you. We, we, for this road that you've put us on in this life, we, we need your direction and guidance and help. Lord, we know that you love us. Help us, Lord, to have this faith that you want us to have, that you are not pleased unless we have it. Uh, let us willing to make these steps to trust you, Lord. It's all faith is, is trusting you, and help us to do that. Lord, thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your love. God, as always, we thank you for what you are going to do. In Jesus' dear name we pray. Amen. Uh, this verse uh, it says, Be careful with nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. When we pray about something, we should always thank God. There's something in our lives to be thankful for. In fact, many times there's more things to be thank thankful for, and there's problems, but we only think about the problems. Uh, don't let a uh, problem or trial erase a hundred blessings that God has given you. Don't let that happen. What you have, you're facing something. We've talked a lot about this, and, and go to God and say, you know, if, you, if, if it's, so, it's so impossible, you don't, you, don't, you don't know what to do, even where to start, just say, God, oh, I just can't wait to see how you're going to make a blessing out of this. That's what you do. Can't wait to see how you're going to solve it. Because you know that I can't. You know I don't have the money. You don't have the, I don't have the intelligence. I don't have the strength. I don't have anything. But God, you have everything. And I'm your child, and I'm going to follow you. You want me to trust you, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give it to you. I'm not going to think about how you're going to solve the problem. Because that's a problem in itself, just trying to think of how you're going to solve it. Because I'll get discouraged because, in my mind, I can't see how it can be done. And then I start getting discouraged about the whole thing, and I want to give up. Say, God, I give it to you, period. And then go on with your life. And what do you do while you're waiting for God to answer a prayer? Did that guy say that time? Brush your teeth. 
That's what you do. You do the things that you always do. You go forward. You do the things you always do. And you've given it to God and you're leaving it up to him. Our God is good. He is worthy. He is trustworthy for these things. You know, I was, uh, I was down in El Paso. Uh, the church down there was a uh, little church. Was, was struggling, and a lot of churches have problems. They were trying to get people to come, and, and they had an average of maybe three or four visitors a month. And the people, you know, they, and, and I wanted to do something to, to help out the church. Uh, I didn't want to get the pastor in the middle of it because the pastor's always in the middle of everything, you know, and he's, he's overworked enough. So what I did is I got a friend of mine from Bearing Precious Seed there, Nathan Pennell, those of you who've been on the mission trip, you know him, he's a, he's a printer. And we were going to pray for the church, do an all-night prayer vigil. Uh, we made it, decided it was going to be on a Thursday night. Thursday night at 7 o'clock, and we were going to pray till Friday morning at 7 o'clock. Now, the reason we picked the Thursday instead of Friday is because we were going to give our night's sleep to the Lord. And we're going to go right back to work on Friday, just leave it on and so um, and we got the people in the church involved. There's other people who were coming at different times during the night. They signed up, and they'd come and pray. And, and we asked the ladies that uh, wanted to pray to not come into the church or whatever in the middle of the night to just set up a time at home and pray there because we didn't want any, any uh, you know, ladies being out in the middle of the night. And, and so we uh, decided when we were going to pray, we are going to pray for 30 minutes praising God and 30 minutes crying out to God. 30 minutes praying God, uh, praising God, 30 minutes crying out to God. You know what it's like taking 30 minutes and praising God and thinking about what you're thankful for? I'm telling you, there's so many things that start coming. When you start thinking about it, how many blessings you have, and even blessings for stepping out in the sun in a cool day and the warm sun on your skin, how much you like that, a breeze, a cool breeze, a hearing the wind going through the trees is calming, peaceful. I mean, there's so many things. When you start thanking God, I mean, I mean it's wonderful. It, it's exciting to do that. We're all blessed immensely. We just forget about those things. We need to count our blessings. But we did that all the night from 7 o'clock at night till uh, 7 o'clock in the morning. Now, let me just say, um, doing something like that, you've got to be careful. pastor needs to be careful. Because when you make such an attack on the darkness like that, there's going to be a repercussion. It's like you blasting out into that darkness and giving Satan a bad time, bad time he's going to respond. He's going to come back. Uh, but one of the things during the night, I wanted to, I wanted to, now we have prayed for different things and needs and people's uh, health and all that sort of thing. And I wanted to pray something because a lot of people, you know, they don't see God answering prayer, and I want to have some particular thing that would be obvious that only God could do. I want to be something reasonable, not some foolish thing, and something that would further, you know, something God would want us to pray about. So I, I added a prayer in there, and everybody was praying this all night long, that on, this was Thursday and Friday, that the following Sunday, we'd have so many visitors that we know it all had to be from God. Now, I, I didn't have enough faith to put a number on that, but God knew whatever that was, you know. Like I said, they'd get three to four visitors a month. Sunday came up. We had 25 visitors come in that church. thought somebody parked a bus in the parking lot. All these people started coming in. And, you know, that was such a blessing to the people, those of us who were praying that night. What a blessing, because we knew where that came from. Right. And re in fact, the reason I had done that was because, or even did a prayer like that, was because a friend of mine that, went, that was in Cuba told me that in Cuba it was against the law to, uh, to, to proselytize. You can't go door to door. They'll arrest you for that. But if somebody walks in, the, you can have a church, and if somebody walks in the front door of the church, you can talk to them about it. But how do you get to do that? They'd pray. Before church every Sunday, they'd sit on the, get on their knees and they'd pray that people would come through the door. And they would. And that's how they built their church. You think, is that? Well, it's God we're talking to. Sometimes we forget that. We think it's all up to us. I mean, God can solve that problem too. 
such a blessing. We, we love that. Um, one of the things in growing up, our, our, our children, you know, we had, a, we had a prayer list, we called it. And uh, whenever somebody had a prayer they, they wanted to uh, pray, they could put, it was a reason, it had to be something reasonable, they could put it on their prayer list. Well, uh, and so we, we would have a, a date of when we asked the prayer, and then uh, the description of what the prayer was, and then we had an open date over here when God answered the prayer. It was really, that was really kind of a neat thing we did. If you don't think God answers prayer, just start a book like that and then look back at it later as it, things come in. Sometimes the answer immediately, sometimes later. Um, and by the way, I found that old, I found one of those books. We had several of them, and I was looking through that. It was pretty, it was pretty neat. But anyway, um, our daughter Krista, she was, uh, um, well, before I say that, let me say this. We had a missionary come to church. Whenever missionaries would come to our, our church there in Minnesota, I would always try to get them to come to lunch or, or come to, at our house or uh, supper or maybe they could spend the night there because missionaries always had these great stories. And the, I would, my children loved to hear these things because there's something that, there's some, you know, the impossible things that you hear. We talk about stories you wouldn't write in a fiction book because people wouldn't like the book because they wouldn't believe it. But for, for the reality of that, it, it was such a blessing. Well, this missionary came, and he was, uh, um, we told him, you know, our, we, he was on a Sunday, and so he was going to come to our house Sunday for lunch. Now, we're about within 20 minutes or 15 minutes from the church, and and he said he'd, and we left the church, church with service was over about 12.15, and he said he'd be there probably about uh, 1 o'clock, uh, and we gave him directions how to get there. We're pretty close. So we got back to the house, and we had dinner ready 1 o'clock, and he wasn't there, 1.15, 1.30, 145, and finally 2 o'clock, he shows up. He says, oh, I'm really sorry. I, I got lost. I, I, I don't normally, you know, I'm a, I'm a good driver, but I, I don't know why. I just, I got lost. I couldn't. Meanwhile, my daughter, Krista, she was kind of kind of sinking low in the chair there, and I, I didn't really notice that at first. And he was going on, I'm really sorry, and I said, it's not a problem at all, you know, sit down, and we started talking, and, and then finally, Krista whispers and says, now she was a cleanie. And she didn't think the house was clean enough, so she was praying that he'd get lost. She'd have enough more time to clean the house. <laughs> I want to tell you, I told that missionary that, and he laughed. He could hardly stand. He thought, man, I'll live in a power of prayer. He says, but the next time, you know, I want to get out. It's okay, you know. But we laughed about that. But it's true. God hears prayer, and sometimes you want to be careful of the things you pray about. When uh, on that prayer list we had, uh, now, computers, for, for years I've been, worked in the computer field, and home computers came out, I did not want one, because I thought, couldn't I see these dumb things all day long? I don't want to look at them all night long. And so, uh, but, you know, it was the way, I knew the world, you know, was coming to that, so we needed one for our children. We homeschooled our kids, and they needed to know about this and be able to use these things, but I didn't have any money. So, we put the prayer, and here was my prayer, Lord we need a computer. It needs to be a good computer, a new computer, but I don't have any money to pay for it. So we need you to just give it to us. <laughs> don't you love those kind of prayers? I put it down there and uh, use it for our family. And when I, when I tell this story, I tell, you know, that there's uh, basically computers are, well, I used to call them as either IBM or Macintosh, you know, there's kind of two different types of computers you can buy. And uh, God showed me which one he preferred with his prayer. Uh, we prayed it, and six months later, in the mail, all boxed up a brand new IBM computer, about a $2,000 for this thing, and it was free. What, what happened was, I was working for this guy, as I said, I was a computer consultant, so I sometimes work for different companies, and this guy, he t after I had this prayer, uh, I'd been working for him about eight months or something like that. He told me, he says, anybody who works for me for the first year, I always buy him a computer. This is after we did the prayer request. And so the computer came in the mail. God can do that. God, the point here is that God does answer prayer. Uh, the, Lord is, um, the Lord has been really good. Now, we had a, a couple friends of ours. Uh, There's another one of our little list, computer list things. And they were really struggling. 
they, uh, we, they're, they're friends, and they were trying to sell their house. Now, those of you who have children, and you want to sell your house, you got to keep the house looking like somebody could walk through there all the time. And when you have little kids, that's not easy to do because you're trying to keep it clean as clean as clean. And, um, but anyway, uh, this couple had been two years on the market like that, and they'd been living like that. And they had, I don't know, several little kids, and it was really hard on them. And his wife was there kind of weeping, and, and so he said, well, we'll put on a prayer list. So we wrote it on a prayer list, and I think it was three days later, somebody walked in and said, we'll take it. No, I don't know if that was just us, but I'm telling you, when we put on a prayer list, God answers prayer. So, you know, what anybody else can do it. They're going to say, God answers prayer. Now, uh, I, since my son's here, I should probably talk a little bit about him. Um, when, he was, when he was 13, or when he was about to have his 13th birthday, we were in El Paso. And he really wanted, and it was in the middle of the week, and he really wanted to have his birthday in Mexico. Because it's his 13th birthday. He says, Dad, I really like them. I thought, well, this is going to really be good because we have a week scheduled then. And it was in the middle of the week, and you know, he was going to be in Mexico that week. However, we usually took, um, now, when people would come on a mission trip, you have so many people, we have, a bu we have two buses and, a, and a, uh, a truck we would take in. Now, we, which we have just so many seats on these things. Now, we wouldn't take two buses if we didn't have to because the extra fuel in that. Well, this particular group that came was, I can't remember exactly how many here, but it filled up the bus, and with the workers and the people, the essential people we had to take, filled up the, and we couldn't take all the workers. And Sherry wasn't going to go, Tanya wasn't going to go, and Adam wasn't going to go. And uh, because they, it was filled up, it just, you know. And Adam came up to me and he says, boy, Dad, I really wanted to go on that trip. And I said, well, pray about it. Now, okay, what are you going to pray here? Because all the seats are filled. And I said, well, if you're going to pray about it, make sure you pack a bag. Did you ever hear the story about the two farmers, you know, they're both praying for rain, and one of them prepared his field for the rain. So which one had the most faith? The one who prepared his field. So I said, if you're planning on doing this, you get, be ready to go. So five minutes before the bus left, one of the workers that was going, didn't feel very good, went up and up chucked in the bathroom. And the, um, the bat, Brother Demarest's wife, she, was, she saw that, she says, we cannot, you can't go. She said, well, I feel fine enough to go. And she says, look, we can't have any sick people on the bus going for six or eight hours, you know, because everybody's going to be sick. And she turns and says, Adam, you ready to go? And he says, yes, I am. And he ran home and took about a minute, and came back in the back on the bus, and off he went. So God, God took care of that. And, and you know, um, that is, such a, that is such a blessing. I mean, it's excited him. And, and I always was very careful to share these things and recognize and explain how God was the one who was doing things. He was the one so that my children understood about this faith. It's very important to do that with your children. Now, Tanya, you know, Tanya, you, uh, she had plenty of things happen to her, and I need to talk about her, too. Um, now, they, all three of them went to college, and I mentioned that the other day, and uh, uh, college was one of those things that, uh, you know, as a missionary, I, I couldn't afford to put my kids through college, but God could, and he did. Um, wasn't some rich guy did it. We just kept praying every month, and God came up with a $2,000 a month for four years, four and a half years. We had him in college there. Anyway, that's a whole lot of things stories of that. But anyway, one of that one time during that, um, uh, the, they worked at the college, okay? And, the, and working at the college paid about 40% of it, of their bill. And then 60%, God was taking care of. Well, Tanya had, uh, her, she majored in boy, or majors in art, and minored in voice. And she came up to me and she said, you know, Dad, my, my grades are, are, these are hard on me doing this because I don't have enough time with art and with voice. I need time to practice. I, I need that. And my, my grades are suffering because of that. And she said, so 
If God can take care of 60%, he can take care of 100%. So I'm going to quit my job so I can be able to get better grades. And I said, well, you got the faith, man. Go ahead. So she did, and he did. And it was just a, I mean, it was a blessing. God, God took care of it. She, she just went, went for it. Now, one of the things, too, that, uh, and, and this was one of the times this happened, uh, I think that sometimes God, when you pray for something, you can't say to God, I have to have this. Even though it's, it's very, very important, you can't tell God you have to have it. You have to be willing to say, okay, I'll, I'll give it up. Now, let me explain a little bit that note. I'm going to use Tanya again. Uh, she had a school bill. There was $1,000 that um, she needed. Now, when it came time to pay the bills, you had to pay the bills to school. You've got to pay the bills. And so uh, she needed this $1,000, and, and it wasn't there. It wasn't there. We prayed about it. It wasn't there. And pretty soon, we're getting down almost to the last day. And she said, well, well if, if, I, if, I have to, you know, if I have to leave school, I'll just leave school. Well, the day that the, um, that the bill needed to be paid, the $1,000, I got a I got an email from a, from a guy who found out that we, that about this need, and he said, I would be honored to pay that. I mean, this guy lived in another state, and we, we uh, so I called up Tanya, and I said, there's a guy who said he was going to pay it. And she said, oh, she was excited. She was jumping around. So she ran to the, but I said, but he, I, I don't know if he's paid it yet. It's got to be paid within, like, within a couple of hours there, but I don't know if it got paid yet or not. And so she took off for the accounting place there, which was lined with people. They had kids because it was the last day, you know. Of, you know, you had the payments in, and it was just, I don't know, probably 20 or 25 people in each one of the lines, and she was at the back. She ran in. The first person she ran in, she had to tell them about it. She was all excited. This man's going to pay for my thousand. And so some guy, I don't think you even knew the guy, kept right on talking away to him, and he got excited too about it. In the meantime, I was trying to find out. I, I didn't want to call the guy because, you know, he thought, uh, hey, it's really nice you paid it, but did you pay it? You know, because we only got a little bit of time here. I thought, well, I'm not going to call him. I'm going to call the accounting office. So I called the accounting office, and I asked them, and the lady checked. I said, this is Tanya Jarvison. Here's her student ID, and so they looked it up. He says, it's paid in full. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. I listen, I think my daughter is in the room there. Could you tell her that, the, that it's there? So she comes out. She says, is there Tanya Jarvis in this room there? And the guy's going, yeah, she's right here. She's right here. He's pointing down. You know, he's a big, tall guy, you know. And she goes running up there. Oh, you got it, paid. I got my money. So anyway, she was, <laughs> it is such a time of rejoicing when God some, does something like that. But many times he likes to do it at the last minute. You know, sometimes we, we don't necessarily like the last minute, but God, um, he, he wants to do that. And he does that because the last minute is a time when, when we, don't, we don't like it because we have no chance at the last minute to do it ourselves. We have to trust God and we have to depend on him. And there's no, there's no other choices then. And that's why God likes to weigh that. We don't like that. And sometimes we don't wait. We give up before that time because we're not willing to wait on God. I remember we're driving down to uh, uh, El Paso from Minnesota, and uh, we had old station wagons and cars. Rarely the air conditioning work, and uh, it was hot. <laughs> we're going down there, and it was, and it, we saw that, and we're praying, God, you know, could you make it cooler? Well, there was a big old storm comes up, and I thought, well. If you're really hot and it's raining, you've got to shut the windows. That doesn't make it cooler. That makes it worse. But the storm came up on our left and blocked the sun. The rain didn't come over on us. It just went along the side. We went down for hundreds of miles with that storm keeping us cool as we drove down the road. It was just a blessing. God, because God could do that. And he did that because... He loved us. He doesn't always do things just because you have a need. And yes, needs, he, he wants to meet those needs. He sometimes does things just because he loves you. Because that's the kind of God he is. He's a good God. He does good things. 
When I, uh, I told you that when I first went down to El Paso, that uh, I went down the summer of 96 and the summer of 97. Now, I went just for the summer, so when I came back, uh, in fact, when I, I told you, I told my boss I was going to quit because I'm going to, the, to um, El pa in the mission field for three months. And, uh, of course, he was shocked and didn't think I knew what I was doing. But he said, well, he says, I, I think that mission, that's a noble thing to do. He says, and I, we have a lot of work here to do. He says, so when you come back, just call me up. You know, I'll give you a job back. And I thought, that's perfect. So we went down there, worked for three months. I'm coming back, and I'm thinking, this is great. I am going to get my job back. In fact, you know, here I am serving God. I kind of deserve it, you know. He's going to give me the job back. Oh, that was a bad thought went through my mind. I don't know why I think things like that. Anyway, when I got there, I went up to this guy, and I said, hey, I'm back. Here I am. You know, I had a great time. He goes, oh, that's really good. He said, you know, I don't know. Things just kind of really dried up around here, and I, I can't really hire you back. I thought, oh, okay. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a computer consultant. I, I've changed jobs. I was used to look at, I got a month, you know, money that lasts me for a month, so I'm going to um, look for another job. Oh, one week went by, two weeks, three weeks. I'm not finding a job. Finally, I'm halfway through the fourth week, I get a call from this friend of mine in North Dakota. Now, I'm in Minnesota. He says, uh, hey, brother, how you doing? He says, are you working? Which was really an odd question, because I hadn't talked to this guy in several years. And he asked me if I was working. And I said, well, uh, no, actually, I'm not. And he says, well, that's good. How'd you like to, he says, how'd you like to come with me to North Dakota? There, it's the sugar beet harvest. They have these sugar beets. They harvest them, and what? And yet, you, you got to drive a sugar beet truck, big old truck, 24 gears on that thing. And, and he said, um, it's 10 days, $10 an hour, 12-hour shifts for 10 days. And you know, I said, okay, you know, I got nothing else uh, I'm doing. So, so I, I was, I was happy I was getting that. So I'm, I'm sitting. We're in church. It was Sunday morning. It was the last day of the month. I'm getting ready to leave, and I'm going to go. I went to church in the morning. I was going to leave in the afternoon. It was about a six-hour, seven-hour trip to get to uh, North Dakota from there. And um, my wife's sitting next to me, and she says, uh, how much money do we have? I said, well, um, I got enough money for gas, and I've got a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter. I'm OK to get there, and they'll probably pay me something when I get there. And I'm leaving you 20 bucks. And she said, um, our house payment is due tomorrow. And I said, you know, I look at it this way. When you're in a corner and you got nowhere to go, that's the time to get excited because that's when God works. And she stood there and looked at me as that chair came down cheek. And I said, so, love you, honey. Goodbye. And <laughs> off I went. Now, we had actually two cars, but the car I left with was broken down. and it, I wasn't able to fix it. I wasn't no car. Right? So she had the broken down car and 20 bucks. And uh, I don't think she'd get anywhere to spend it anyway. But So off I go. And I promised I'd talk to her once I got there. Well, that night after church, they had a um, uh, special um, offering at the, uh, or a, uh, I think it was a, somebody's, um, somebody had a baby. And so they're having a, giving gifts for the baby. And my wife went to, somebody picked her up and brought, the, brought her there with the kids. And uh, they said, and she, she told me, she said, we had this, this special thing tonight, and somebody, so people came up to me and gave me checks, enough to take care of the whole month, because they knew that we were having a rough time there. I said, well, praise the Lord. And she said, but I don't have any way to get to the bank. <laughs> and then a guy from the church came over, hauled the car out of there, fixed the whole thing. And it took care of everything. So it, everything God took care of at the last minute. You know, God wants us to trust in him. He wants us to be able to look at him and say, God, we trust you. I trust you. We have a, we have a problem before us we can't solve. We have a mountain that we're looking at we can't solve. We don't know what to do, God. We have to turn to you. And the problem is, is when you don't turn to him, 
That's when you struggle and you fight your life. You, you struggle and you struggle because nothing, nothing goes right and you, you get angry with God and, and God says, why don't you trust me? Why don't you have a step of faith? Say, give the problem to me. Say, God, I'm going to give this burden to you because you can't carry the burden. And God wants us, if we, if we would just do that, we make our lives so difficult because we leave him out of it. It's a foolish thing to do for a Christian. God loves us more than you could imagine. If you look at Psalm 119.68, God is a good God. He does good things. And as uh, my son was saying, when you argue with God, he's always right and you're always wrong. That's the way it is when you get in an argument with God. Because he knows and you don't. And that's the point. He knows you don't. You have no idea. Well, uh, the following summer, we came back from, uh, uh, and in fact, we went down there the, the, the second summer when we, when, we, when we left Minnesota. One of the things I had to do was sell my house. And uh, I had a big talk with the missions committee, and they said, you know, they gave me this list of things, you know, do you have insurance, do you have this, that, and the other thing, and yes, uh, I got that. And they said, well, what are you going to do if your house doesn't sell? I said, well, um, there has to be some place here where you trust God. I don't have a solution if my house doesn't sell. For $1,000 a month house payments, I have, to, I have to sell the house. I know that. I have enough money for three house payments. And then I don't have any more. I, I, I certainly wouldn't want the bank to take it back or something like that. But So uh, I went down there and... and um, one month went by, two months went by. Now, we were already down in El Paso, and the house was up there. We left all the furniture in it, and uh, we are praying that God would, um, God would take care of this. And, and three months, I make the final payment, and not anybody had even looked at the house. Nobody, was, nobody wanted to even interested at all. And, uh, and you know, there wasn't much time left. But understand... God doesn't care about the time any more than he cares about the money. He, but he still wants you to trust him, even if there's a little amount of time. Because he can solve things on the last day. He can solve it at the last minute, at the last hour, as he's done with me sometimes. I've seen him do that. And sure enough, I made that final payment. Partway through that month, some buddy walked in, looked at the house, says, well, take it. The house was sold. Now, uh, that was a blessing. God was showing me that he could come through in that, but I, I want to I take this a little bit further, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude here. But uh, I thought that was really important that I sold my house. Now, wouldn't you think that there was, there was a bunch of equity in the house that I was going to get, and, and that, that was important? And I, I did. I got $42,000 that house. And I thought, wow, praise the Lord, I got this money. That is really a great thing. Everybody should have a whole bunch of money like that. <laughs> oh, let me tell you something. For the next year and a half, I didn't hardly have to pray at all. All I needed to do was take the money out of there and buy whatever I wanted to and just keep cruising along. I didn't have to worry about nothing. And I didn't have to think about God until, you know, you can't just keep doing that forever. It ran out after about a year and a half. I spent that money, and God said, see, the money didn't help you. In fact, it was worse for you because you didn't even talk to me. You thought, I don't need to. I got all this. Look what I have. But I really didn't have anything. What I didn't have at that time was the Lord. And God, God once you reach these times, it's good. You've already, now did you learn something from this? Yes, I learned something from that. And so then after that, then I depended on God. And you know what? The thing about God, the difference between a missionary and a millionaire is the millionaire is limited to a million dollars, and the missionary isn't. Because his father's a cat on a thousand hills. He just doesn't give it to you all at once because he knows you'll get corrupted, because that's how we are. He gives it to you when you need it. And you need to remember that when you're out there, and those of you who are kind of nervous about making a big step or... You know, you're hearing these things about missionaries, and you're uh, Adam, and you've heard these men talking about how God touched them, and, 
stepping out in faith, and there's certainly a whole lot of faith in doing something like this. And there's a reason God doesn't give you all the information ahead of time about missions. And, uh, but what God wants you to do is trust him. And God will provide when the time comes. Not necessarily give you your wants, but he meets your needs, and he gets you there. And as when we talked about the Israelites in the wilderness, you've got to be real careful about complaining about just your needs being met. That should be sufficient. God isn't one to hold back from you. But he knows that if in your heart that you're going to start complaining like the Israelites did, he knew they were going to do that. Then he, that's how he withhold a little bit of the water or whatever. And there they went. And you know, by the way, the reason they were there for, had to go into the wilderness 40 years, not only was just the parents had to die because he was angry with them, he was really upset with them because when he referred to them as your carcasses are going to fall in this wilderness. And you wouldn't really please there. But the, but the young people learn from the parents. You know, children are just like their parents. And usually, if you, if you read when the Bible talks about when he, when he got rid of somebody, a lot of times it was their whole family. You know, everybody, everybody that's due with their family to breed that would get rid of them because all the families like the parents. And if the parents are doing badly, the family's going to do badly. So what he was doing there in the wilderness, he had to teach their children to trust him. And everything that happened, all the food they got was all a miracle. The water came was a miracle. They couldn't grow anything. They couldn't do anything themselves. They had to trust God. They, that, so they would see that they could trust God, that he was the one who, who they could trust. They could believe him when the time came, and they did. It wasn't very easy sometimes. They still even complained about things. But that's how God wants us to be. He wants us to be able to trust him all the time. Our God is a good God. He does good things. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, we love you so much, and we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you answered prayer. Lord, there's a purpose you have in these things. There's a purpose you have for us turning to you so that we will become dependent on you just as children are dependent on their parents. You want us to turn, when a young child grows up, they want to turn their dependence from their parents to you. Because we don't know the right way. We don't know the right things. And Lord, you do. God, we love you. We thank you. I mean, God, we pray that you would guard us, guide us, direct us, help us, strengthen us this week. Lord, that we would do what you would have us to do. Lord, thank you for your goodness and mercy. And Lord, as always, we will thank you for what you are going to do. And in Jesus' dear name we pray. Amen. You can remain seated with your heads bowed for a moment. James said it this way, ye have not because ye ask not. Something that's key, I think, in what one of the things he said was, when he was praying about one of those things, he said it was about six months later. When's the last time you prayed six months about something? We, we in America are so instant. We pray about something for about six minutes. And if God doesn't answer, we don't pray anymore. We start figuring out a way we can make it happen. We can get it to, fi we can figure it out. Old preacher, Dr. John R. Rice, you say all our failures are prayer failures. I know that God spoke to hearts tonight. There's one area of our lives as Christians that we talk more about than we practice. It's prayer. God has spoken to your heart tonight. I want you to respond to him. There's some of you need to, you know that God's convicted you about praying. Some families that need to pray. Some that need to, You've been, you've been trusting God for a need, but you give up praying about it, and you've been trying to start figuring out how you can make it happen. And you need to get out of the picture and let God be God. Let him take care of it. The altar is going to be open for you to respond to him this evening. Father, thank you for the message tonight. Thank you, Lord, for being our God. Thank you for being the God that hears 
prayer. Forgive us for our prayerlessness, for our lack of bringing everything to God in prayer. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll hear our prayer this evening, that we'll leave this building in a few moments different than when we came in because of what we've heard this evening. Now, Father, have your way in every heart and life, please. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening, will you please? That's right. You have longed for sweet peace Amen. and for faith to increase right. and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest if you yield him your body and soul. Would you walk with the Lord in the light of his word and have peace and contentment always? You must do his sweet will to be free from all ills on the altar your all you must lay is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid your heart does a spirit control you can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Oh, we never can know what the Lord will bestow of the blessings for which we have prayed. Till our body and soul he doth fully control and are all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does a spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Be seated, if you will. Thank you, Brother Jarvis. You. Great message. Uh, missionaries, and, and everybody, go. If you have children in the nursery, go get them right now, okay, and bring them up to with you here to the service, okay? want everybody in for this closing part of the service. Um, you know, Brother Jarvis, I remember reading the verse in Hebrews 4.12 about come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help. What's the last part of the verse say? In time of need. And I was reading a sermon by Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon was a preacher back in the 1800s in England. And he said that little phrase in time of need means in the nick of time. You'll find grace to help in the nick of time. And I thought, boy, he said that almost 200 years ago <laughs> and uh, it's still the truth you know you understand God isn't God doesn't operate in time God said what did he say he told Moses who's who, who sent me what did God say tell him I am sent them unto you God God isn't I was and God isn't I'm going to be God is I am he's always in the present and so when we tell we try to tell God what time it is, He's like, "What? What are you? What are you talking about?" Uh, it's and by the way, it's it's never over till God says it's over. Remember Mary and Martha? Huh? 
their brother died. Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Now it's too late. That's what they were saying. And Jesus said, tell me where he is. He says, do you believe the resurrection? Well, I believe he's going to raise one day. He said, no, no, you got the wrong idea. The resurrection isn't an event. It's a person. I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> and Jesus brought him back from the dead. About how about that? Now, do you think they would have rather had their say, hey, Jesus healed my brother? Or Jesus raised my brother from the dead? Huh? That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I got a brother who raised from the dead. Brother Sharpana? Yeah. 